Welcome to this video series about measuring value creation in private equity, where we look at how things like EBITDA growth, multiple expansion, and debt pay down drive private equity returns. My name is Mike Reinard. I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I run a website called Auxilia Mathematica, and I wrote a book titled Private Equity Value Creation Analysis. These videos cover findings from my work, website, and book, and they're designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital and evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download the Excel files behind every episode. This second video of VC102 explains the math behind the conventional value bridge. It's what you'll find most GPs and LPs using out there in the field. As I mentioned in the last video, it works best for companies whose net debt is around zero, and it tends to go off the rails when you have a lot of leverage or growth equity. The next two or three videos will demonstrate models that do a better job with leverage, but it's worth spending time on this model because there's a few things that we need to understand and fix before we move on to the more interesting ones. Here's the conventional value bridge that we introduced in the last video. Since most of you are familiar with the approach, I'll breeze through the basic mathematics. The fourth video will prove that the formulas here are accurate. Here we call invested capital TEQV1 for total equity value at time one and realized capital TEQV2 for total equity value at time two. Total equity value creation from the shareholders then would be TECHV2 minus TECHV1 or Delta TECHV. Now, because company enterprise valuation is equal to the sum of equity and net debt, total equity value creation is equal to the change in total enterprise value minus the change in net debt. So delta tech V equals delta TEV minus delta ND. The next step is to define the enterprise valuation in terms of a valuation multiple and a performance metric like TTM, EBITDA, or revenue. For example, a $180 million company with TTM EBITDA of 30 would have a valuation multiple of 6.0x because six times 30 equals 180. This allows us to break the delta TEV term into two new value drivers, EBITDA growth, which is the change in EBITDA times some measurement of the holding period valuation multiple, and multiple expansion, which is the change in the multiple times some measurement of holding period EBITDA. And then we have this debt pay down term, which is simply minus the change in net debt. And this gives us the company level or total shareholder value drivers. If you wanna measure value creation for a specific shareholder, like a fund or a GP, then we need to change these tech V terms into FEC V terms for fund level equity value. And then the GP or fund level value creation formulas are as follows. These are like the formulas for all shareholders, but they have this extra factor, the Greek letter phi, that represents some measurement of the GP's ownership percentage. So then for a funder GP, you get a value bridge like this one, where the bars are generally driven by a change in EBITDA, a change in valuation, and a change in net debt. And if you do everything right, the value drivers will add up to the correct number and bridge the gap between invested equity and realized equity. Now, in order to make sure that this conventional value bridge works as well as possible and to set us up for the more interesting value creation models to follow, we should fix a few things that I think cause analysts a lot of trouble. There are three rules that if we follow them, they'll make our models more rigorous and less volatile. The first point is that the X sub T terms, the ones for the holding period EBITDA or valuation multiple should always be holding period averages. I represent averages with over bars like this one here. Now, a lot of models out there, they like to use entry or exit values for E sub T and M sub T rather than the averages. Technically, you can do that and still get the value drivers to add up to the right total, but holding period averages are superior for several reasons. To show that, let's consider three possible formulas for multiple expansion. Option A uses the entry EBITDA for E sub T, option B uses the exit EBITDA for E sub T, and option C uses the average of entry and exit EBITDA as we recommend. The first argument for option C is that it makes more intuitive sense. If multiple expansion is the change in multiple times some measurement of holding period EBITDA, which EBITDA is most likely to be the most representative of overall holding period conditions? Is it the EBITDA on the first day of the hold, EBITDA on the last day of the hold, or something in between? Usually it will be an EBITDA in the middle, and option C provides that because the average of two numbers by definition always falls between the two. Second, holding period averages reduce volatility. If you look at the three multiple expansion formulas and stress them a bit with different EBITDAs and multiples, you find that whenever both E and M increase, option B is biased towards multiple expansion and against EBITDA growth. And the same thing happens when both E and M decrease. Option A is biased towards multiple expansion and against EBITDA growth whenever E and M move in opposite directions. The use of holding period averages makes option C always split the difference between option A and option B, and this makes the formulas less volatile and more consistent over a wider range of scenarios. The third point is that holding period averages are more mathematically appropriate. This is pretty technical, so I won't go too deep, but try to think back to Calculus 101. 
The concept of integration is typically introduced by doing this problem of Riemann sums. That's where you take the area under the curve and you approximate it by measuring the area of several rectangles underneath that curve. By making those rectangles skinnier and adding more of them, you get a better approximation of the area. Now consider how this might apply to the value creation models. Let's say you hold a company for four years. Instead of taking one multiple expansion measurement for the entire holding period, what if we take four annual multiple expansion measurements and add them up? Or even better, let's take 16 quarterly multiple expansion measurements and add those up. What you find is that regardless of whether you calculate multiple expansion with a formula in option A, option B, or option C, as those rectangles get skinny, all three formulas converge to the option C answer. Option C is always the better fit to the curve. This seems to be a bit strange at first, but it makes sense when you think about these formulas geometrically. Option A is basically the area of a rectangle with delta M on one side and entry EBITDA on the other. Option B is the area of a rectangle with delta M on one side and exit EBITDA on the other. The formula for option C is the area of a trapezoid whose base is delta M and whose sides are E1 and E2. A trapezoid will always fit a curve better than a rectangle. This is why your old calculus text had a section about the trapezoidal rule, and why your old scientific calculator, probably a TI-84, used trapezoids for numerical integration. Option C always provides the best mathematical representation of holding period conditions. So in our models, you'll find holding period averages everywhere, not just for the multiple and the EBITDA, but also for revenue, EBITDA margin, ownership percentages, equity ratios, etc. They provide results that are less volatile, and in general, they make all the equations work better. The second rule is that we should always calculate every value driver directly and never use a plug. What does this mean? Well, sometimes, tragically, value drivers don't add up to the right total. They don't bridge the gap between invested equity and realized equity, and there's this error that we show in red. Now, a common way of fixing this is basically ignoring the problem or hiding it. They may say, hey, we know fund level value creation, delta effect V from the fund quarterly report, so why don't we just calculate two of the value drivers and let the third one make up the difference? We can make multiple expansion equal to value creation, less EBITDA growth, less debt pay down, and miraculously, the value drivers add up to the right number. This is what we call a plug, and as you could probably guess, it's a terrible practice because any errors in the analysis will always accumulate in that plug. In later videos, we'll talk about where these errors can come from and how to prevent them, but for now, the point is we should never use a plug. They inject volatility into the results, and they often prevent meaningful comparisons between different models or even two different companies being analyzed with the same model. Instead, we will always calculate every value driver directly, and if the numbers don't add up, we'll figure out what's going on and fix the problem. The third rule is something that we mentioned last time. Simply, the delta ND term is not leverage. When you say leverage, most people think about the amplification of equity gains and losses, which is covered by the gearing term. Now, this comes up often because there's this kind of school of thought that says, maybe we shouldn't give the GP full credit for the return driven by leverage because higher debt correlates to higher risk, and after all, it's only financial engineering. We'll cover this in more detail in later videos. I'll just point out that gearing could go both ways. If you lose money on a deal, debt will make you lose more of it. Your investors are unlikely to ignore the impact of extra losses because it was only financial engineering. Anyway, our delta ND term shows up right here in cash flow generation. This is a better term than debt pay down because the delta ND term is also important to companies without debt. In a growth deal, it measures cash accumulated on the balance sheet or burned for growth. The essential thing is that cash flow generation is different from classic leverage, and regardless of what you think about gearing, GPs should get credit for cash flow generation because it's downstream from all the financing decisions about debt levels, interest rates, and growth capital. We'll talk more about both gearing and cash flow generation in later videos. So this ends our general overview of the conventional model of value creation and the three rules that'll make all of your value creation models more robust and more meaningful. Always use holding period averages in your value creation formulas. Never use a plug to make the value drivers add up to the right number. And that delta ND term is not leverage. In the next episode, we'll look at a model from academia that uses the weighted average cost of capital in the IRR domain to separate the unlevered return and the leverage effect. Thanks for watching. If you're into this sort of thing, subscribe and check out the website, Auxilia Mathematica. Registration is free and allows you to download Microsoft Excel files with all the data and charts used in these and other videos. On the site, you'll also find other resources like articles, templates, and a private forum for Q&A. When you visit, check out the site's free online value creation calculators. These web pages allow you to select various analysis parameters, plug in your own capital structure, P&L, and market data, 
and then measure value creation with a click of a button. I don't think that these calculators will replace your Excel models, but they're really useful for both preliminary investigations and double checking that your own spreadsheets are generating the right numbers. I should mention that if you're looking for a convenient reference and training tool with a form factor of a college text, make sure to check out my book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis on Amazon.com. And finally, if you'd like to get up to speed with models like this more quickly than the book or the website allow, get in touch. Over the last 15 years, I've helped dozens of GPs build models like this for various fundraising and investor relations projects. Thanks for watching and see you next time.